together, I was like, this is insane. <laughs> and I wanted to figure out like how to do it. Like how, how, how is he doing it? And he, he actually sent, I, I DM'd him and asked him for um, instructions and he sent some instructions and um, part of the instructions was also, um, you know, like a short description of the form. And, and a part of it that really kind of stood out to me was he said, um, looking back, I was also thinking a lot about sonic crowns and how that they, they might be gutted or distilled, uh, made just a little less talky and more mysterious as in what would a single formal sonnet by Rumi and Lucille Clifton look and sound like? So I think it was just like this other layer of um, looking at received forms and how you can, um, you know, break them open and create your own thing. And so when I um, came to that realization, I was like, man, like, um, I really, really wanted to try it out. And then when um, Chris asked me um, to put on an event, for um, you know Jericho Brown's tradition, Jericho Brown's tradition for this one book, one Philadelphia. Um, the first thing that came to my mind was you know the duplex and how he came up with the duplex and and this thing about black invention and black and black forms and coming up with black poetic forms and then you know in thinking about who to bring on for um, this type of talk, I wanted I thought about not just poets but artists who um, create beyond the bounds of my imagination. Like I, you know, who do things that I would never think to do. And, um, and then to bring them on to dive into their creative processes. So, you know, enter, you know, Andrea Walls and Alex Smith. So I, um, I worked with um, Andrea on my book, Jump Ship. Um, she was the first editor and, um, and then getting to know her work, um, her visual work, her digital work, her photography, her, um, her, po her poems, it's just been amazing getting to know um, this multifaceted um, artist and extremely giving and gracious person. Um, and hi, Andrea, <laughs> and, um, and I, I wanted to say a few things about them and then I'm gonna read their official bios, then we're gonna get into it. Um, and Alex Smith, who I, who I first came into contact with um, when I was on Apiary Magazine and um, we did a joint venture with Metro Polarity and hey, Alex. <laughs> and, um, and unfortunately, um, I didn't get to work with Alex directly, but I, when I heard at the apiary launch party, Alex's work, I was like, oh, <laughs> like, oh crap, like this is amazing. And then like getting to know um, the collage work, which is like interstellar and, you know, just uh, blows my mind. So, um, so I wanted to bring both of these artists in to like really dig into their processes and their work. So I just, I just wanna read like their bios really quickly and then we can get into the conversation. So um, first, Alex Smith is a sci-fi writer, um, Rosarium Publishing, Resistance, Battle of Philadelphia web series, uh, Black Vans comic book, an artist, musician, um, art punk bands, Solarize and Rainbow Crimes, an activist, Metro Polarity, which is a queer sci-fi collective, which I mentioned before, and cultural arts critic um, for uh, Pitchfork, The Key, Bandcamp, and Philly Gay News. He is a recipient of the Pew Fellowship woo -woo, in the arts and soon to be published author of the sci-fi, cyberpunk, superhero, Afrofuturist short story collection, Arc Dust, forthcoming from Rosarium Publishing, um, and at Alexoteric on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and here we have Andrea Philly Walls, who is a multidisciplinary artist informed and inspired by the writers and visual artists of the Harlem Renaissance and Black Arts Movement. She is pleased that her writing, scholarship, and visual art have been supported by organizations she admires, including the Leeway Foundation, 
Vona Voices Workshop for Writers of Color, Hedgebrook Residencies for Women Authoring Change, the Color Girls Museum, Writers Room at Drexel University, the Studio Museum of Harlem, the Women's Mobile Museum, and Fab Youth Philly. In addition to the Museum of Black Joy, she is the creator and curator of the archive, author of the poetry chapbook, Ultraviolet Catastrophe, or Thread Makes Blanket Plaque, Thread Makes Blanket Press and the digital web collection, The Black Body Curve. So welcome, Alex and Andrea. I gotta give a clap for them bios, because they, they sit. <laughs> What's up, y'all? Um, and thank you for coming. I really, really, really appreciate um, both of you um, accepting my invites. Um, so I kind of wanted to start with um, a question that is deep on my mind um, and, and it relates to artistic practice. And it's with, you know, if, if this week has been really heavy for our community. And, and I wanted to talk a little bit or discuss with you a little bit about how that heaviness, these like charged um, external stimuli affect your artistic practice? Like, do you find it fertile ground? Are you like steeped in thought? Or, um, or are you just like, or is artistic practice like the farthest thing from your mind? Um, and either one of you can, can go or answer the question. Um, well, for me, um, it's been actually kind of difficult um, in the past year uh, for a lot of reasons, um, a few medical things and a few um, interpersonal things. My mom passed away. Um, I, I don't usually take celebrity death really hard, but just the sheer amount of amazing people who have been in my life, either peripherally or you know, influentially, you know, um, ugh, it's been kind of rough, you know, Chadwick Boseman, Milford Graves, MF Doom, my favorite rapper. Yes. Um, it's just been really rough. And like you mix that with like, yes, winning the pew and a few other things and getting picked up by Rosarium. It's just been like, I don't know what to do, you know? And I think mm -hmm. yesterday kind of encapsulated that. It was like, you know, Derek Chauvin is found guilty. Um, one minute and then literally the next minute, you know, Makia Bryan is killed. So it's like, we are having a, you know, I'm personally having a tough time celebrating the victories mm -hmm. and like moving forward in my practice. Uh, I feel kind of bad because it's like, like the pew is really cool and they don't have you like hyper focus on specific art. So I'm able to like take my time and sort of um, examine, you know, where I am right now in my art practice. And, uh, um, so that's been really good. Um, and so, but yeah, it's been kind of like difficult for me to sort of, um, parse out like, uh, wanting to do art, wanting to make something that's impactful, but also understanding that it is work. And then like, you know, leaving yourself space to grieve and to be, be a human being and, to feel something has been very, very hard for me. Uh, that's, you know, me personally. So, um, but I think I'm turning a corner personally as well. So mm -hmm. hopefully um, there'll be some interesting things on the horizon. Um, and yeah, I think the internet has given me a, 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 an outlet also to be able to like write a few little things, make a, make a doodle and post it or something and not feel compelled to have this like massive body of work that's like commenting on this moment in history or whatever, you know? So um, for me, it's it's been, and like, you know, I don't really view time as this kind of like linear, like straight arrow thing. I view it as a cyclical kind of spherical, um, multi-dimensional, um, multi-firmamented, um, way of looking at things. So for me, this moment in history has been happening um, since I was able to acknowledge it, you know, when I was born. <laughs> so it's just, so trying to like, you know, yeah. Oh, so okay. if, 
yeah, essentially I'm, I'm, I'm still on the path, but uh, the path is kind of spiraling, not in a negative way, but just, that's just how the path works. The path is a spiral, the path is a sphere and, it, and there's a, a millions of different ways to approach that. Oh, absolutely. Um, Andrea, um, your thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I definitely um, feel you on that, uh, Alex. It's it has been a lot, and uh, this this idea of um, time and and spirals and um, the disconnection from this linear experience has mm -hmm. is kind of um, really true for me as well. And I realize so much of my practice has been this energy that I have to do it in spite of the fact that I'm tired and I never felt like I had enough time because I have to do all of the things that you have to do to maintain, you know, those capital pressures, like, you know, you gotta pay rent, you gotta eat, you gotta take care of your elders and, um, you know, and in this last year, when a lot of that pressure had been removed, you know, that identity of being able to overcome all of these obstacles in order to create had been subverted. And so now I have that thing that I had always held this narrative, well, if I had more time, <laughs> And now I have these, you know, wide expanses of time. And yet I wasn't productive in the same way. Um, and so that was interesting because then you confront yourself, you know, you start um, feeling a certain kind of way, like, well, I'm not being productive. And, and that becomes kind of an accusation mm -hmm. um, it, or it did for me. And um, and then it allowed me to see the other thing that has always been true for me is that I've always been available to feel the things that make me sad, which has always been kind of a problem because if you show your, the ways in which you're sad and you're grieving and you're honest about it, it makes people uncomfortable mm. um, because we're so, uh, you know, we, we, we're taught that you have to get over things immediately and then be in that world and holding up your responsibilities and your obligations. And usually those are connected to those capital claims on your time, right? The things that you do to get the money to do the basic things, right? Um, and so in this kind of reversal of the experience, I didn't realize that I was just, I was sad. I was grieving. Um, I had a, a lot of opportunities that um, all of the work of previous years were coming into fruition at the beginning of 2020. You know, planning to tour uh, some art in South Africa um, that got canceled. Mm. Um, and then it seemed that you know, if you shared that you were grieving about some things that you lost, people were coming at you, well, well, at least you didn't lose your life or like they were, you know what I mean? It felt, it felt like you, we didn't have a right to express the things that we were grieving because so many things were worse for so many people. Um, and that felt unfair, but at the same time, I know what people are saying, right? Um, yeah. And so what had always been the thing that I did to save myself from the sadness, which is making the art, hmm. seemed unavailable. Like I couldn't concentrate to even just read. Right. Um, and then because I work digitally, um, there were so many other streams of uh, global sorrow that were infiltrating the space that I used to create that it didn't feel safe. Mm. Um, but like Alex, I feel like kind of something regenerating in this moment, uh, may, you know, could be spring, could be like the hope we're coming out of it. That said, these, this last couple months has been harder 
in anything. Um, There's also the, the pressure to stay on brand. And like, I love what you were talking about, the capital pressure. There's the pressure to stay on brand, the pressure to produce something in this moment is always, um, I feel like it's a little counterintuitive in a way, but it's, it's something that I think um, audiences or viewers or people who are um, looking towards art to um, find some answers or whatever, kind of like expects or demand without even knowing that they're expecting and demanding. It. It's like, we need your response immediately and I need to be able to download it now and wear it on a shirt and you know what I mean? And like buy it on like <laughs> for harriet.com, like now, you know, we need to do, we need like, you know, so, but, it, it, but like, we're also people who are artists and who are grieving and who are processing. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think something interesting will come from a like dearth of immediacy in art and, and from this void that feels like it needs to be filled, something, something interesting, something new and something transformative. And I think we need to be a little bit more patient and a little less worried about like branding, like you said, so that we can grieve and like process these things. Like, you know, we're part of the community, you know? So yeah, yeah no, sorry, I, I didn't mean to change oh, no. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Like, because I think so often there were so many times during this period where, you know, I signed up for like workshops and completely abandoned them, you know, and then, and then the question ultimately like comes like, what is wrong with me? You know, you have that, that question, like something has to be wrong with me because, you know, I didn't, you know, meet whatever superficial demand that I put on myself, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And, and it almost comes back to this base level of getting to like the, the underlying emotion like if you, especially if you've never been taught to do that, and that's a whole nother conversation of like, you know, you know, you know, mental health and getting down to actually what's, what's bothering you, what's wrong with you. But I think, um, but yeah, but I think it's, it's, it, for me, it's been like, you know, just trying to figure out or like kind of abandoning all of those things that tell me this is what I need to do. Like all of those things that say, you need to push this out. You need to feel this way about that. Like, and just like abandoning all of those things. So yeah, I'm, I'm really, really, um, you know, and I feel, I, I too feel like, you know, it, it turning the corner, you know? So yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm with y'all on that. Um, second question I had was, um, and it was about like your first, um, sort of like your first invention or what you felt like your first invention was. And when I say invention, I mean like something that you felt like just came from your own, you know, ingenuity, like, you know, something that you made or some thought that you put together that you felt like was your first invention. So I feel like I, I really, this was a really difficult question um, to think about, Kerwin. Um, yeah. And so I thank you for it. Uh, but I, I realized that my first invention was this kind of internal process. Um, and I, I kind of liken it to the green book, mm. but I'm gonna call it the gray book because it's not like safe physical spaces. It's finding safe emotional and spiritual spaces because growing up, I grew up at that time, like raised by that generation where, you know, children are meant to be seen, not heard. Like there was no real um, or no formal transfer of knowledge. Like I had to listen in on grown folks conversations to kind of fill in the blanks in my understanding about what it means to be alive, you know, that generation, you know, no information about sex or sensuality or intimacy even, you know, they, their charge was to survive this shit, like, and to hold it up so that we could have the choices that we have now. Um, but a lot of that meant there were um, just these generational silences around so many things. Mm. Um, and I guess in my family, it was like, you were supposed to learn things intuitively, 
Um, but you had to figure that out. <laughs> you know, you kind of had to get the information from the atmosphere. So I did a lot of kind of eavesdropping on buses. So I got a lot of wrong information about a lot of, uh, about a lot of things. Um, and so, and, and we had, there was a lot of frustration within the household and a lot of like violent language within the relationships. So I kind of created this kind of um, network of escape routes. Mm. Like, so where could I go emotionally and spiritually to escape the tension in the house? Yes. Because at that time when I was young, I didn't understand all the pressures outside, you know, for my father in particular. Um, all of those things that he had to swallow in order, again, to maintain the, the capital concern to keep us in a, a house with right. meals um, and all of the things that he had to swallow and all of the ways that they burst out of control, you know, within, within the home. So, you know, and a lot of it had to do with what I would later understand, understand to be my calling towards art. You know, sometimes it would just to uh, look at a, a certain photo in this book that I had that would just let me transport from the moment that was kind of unbearable, but I didn't have the language yet to, to figure out um, how it was impacting me. So I created all of these, you know, kind of intricate um, portals and escape routes and windows from my, you know, relatively windowless room, right? Mm. You know, uh, like places that I could look out and into that were beyond me. Um, and a lot of it did have to do with uh, language, you know, reading books that would mesmerize me. Um, and completely transport um, the, the experience that I didn't know how to get out of. Um, so it's kind of like a, a out of body experience that um, mm -hmm. I began to have um, that I still have access to this way of um, going on a journey Right to just transport the the mind, the body, the the uh, you know just all of that thing that makes your personality that has no shape or form. Right, it's like you can't feel it. It's not your skin, but it's that thing inside of you. Mm. Um, and so I think that was my first uh, invention. No, I feel that it's it's funny because I I really really relate to that. Because I think like part of my first um, invention and, and probably even I would say maybe coping mechanism was like uh, silence. So like, it's like almost like I, you know, because I knew that somebody who was maybe not as gregarious or, you know, aggressive in my house was, you know, given rewards, <laughs> you know, and so like, it's almost like I created like a body double, like, you know, like you have this person who's walking in the world, you know, who maybe doesn't have any real um, agency. And then you have like another person in my mind who like has all of the agency as, and wanting to bust out of that. <laughs> so yeah, I totally agree with that. Oh, what about you, Alex? Um, <laughs> basically the exact same thing. Okay. <laughs> um, right. Um, like, um, whereas, uh, Andrea, you felt like you needed to create something um, that was more of like an outer expression, you know, like you, you, you crave this sort of like a uh, pool of information. Um, for me, it was more like, um, and I guess this is the slight difference is that I like wanted to create inner worlds. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I wanted like secret knowledge and like, I wanted to, to have this sort of like, um, strange, uni like I, I just created strange universes, um, at a very young age that sort of like, um, were, was able to like transport me, 
um, to where I felt like I needed to be. Like I consumed a lot of cartoons, a lot of television, a lot of comic books. Um, I wasn't an avid like reader of novels per se, um, you know, movies, films, TV shows, but I was never like satisfied with them. So my invention turned into like, you know, this mechanism of, of DIY, like at a very, very young age. And I'm part of a lot of that came from like necessity. Like my mom would not buy me, you know, the latest GI Joes and all the transformers in the world. So I had to like literally create my own toys, like from um, like clothespins or something, or like design ways to, um, you know, entertain myself. And um, yeah, I, I always had this like really like passionate uh, thirst for creating like entire universes, like um, in like a day, you know? And I would, um, I would scrap them just as quickly as I created them. So I had a tape recorder as a, as a kid. It was, um, uh, I think it was my 11th birthday. I got a tape recorder and I would just walk around and dictate like films into the tape recorder or I would get my toys um, and sort of like create scenes. But the very next day I would be onto an entirely different universe. And those same toys would have different characteristics and different um, uh, movements and different ideas and different like lifespans, you know, different backstories. And um, so I think my first inventions were like, you know, just worlds and universes that I could like, um, not necessarily see myself in, but where I could like map out like a pathway to the future. And I'm not sure if I realized I was doing that, but um, even to this day, I still rely on those very uh -huh. sort of like uh, bare bones, simplistic methods of uh, creation. Like I still rely on just being that little kid with like a pack of paper and some pencils, like trying to design his way out of boredom, like out of abuse and like, like just like out of not having strong role models you know, uh, to sort of like, to sort of guide me into like, um, you know, as Andrea said, to like create this sort of um, palpable energy where like knowledge about, yes, sexuality, queerness and blackness and just being who you are, like in this space, like um, feels palpable and feels like atmospheric as opposed to just like learning it in a lesson. And that was something that I had to like, kind of like invent for myself. And um, I was I was never ever satisfied with the stories <laughs> that I was given. Um, I've learned to be more, a lot more patient. Um, I think uh, current like um, geek culture, like I'm, I'm deep in the geek culture. So current geek culture has taught me to be more patient, seeing people wig out because um, a superhero that's been white for however many years um, is now played by a black person or something, you know, that's, that's, that's allowed me to see, um, to be a lot more uh, flexible in my ideas. And then like being able to marry my geekness with my like queerness and my blackness and like my sort of, um, I guess for lack of a better term, like anti-capitalist politics or whatever. And just to like understand that all those things can exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, you know, my invention of universes was probably my first um, like pure invention, pure thought that I had that was like solely my own or at least felt like it It was, you know? Like I would read a Daredevil comic and be like, I'm gonna do my own Daredevil. You know, I'm gonna do this own, my own, my own take on it. It's gonna be this whole blown out thing. And so I still try to take that approach to creation even to this day, so. Yeah, no, that that makes perfect sense because as as both of you were talking, I was thinking about, oh man, like, you know, how how did that, you know, that first invention lay the groundwork for all of my artistic output, you know, how often am I coming back to that those sites where those inventions were born and you know, and filling in those gaps between you know, all, you know, time and all those things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really, <laughs> when I think about it, it's like mind blowing. <laughs> like, yeah. really think about some, those, those simple events that happened then are still like, you know, <laughs> spinning me around now. So yeah. 
Um, in the uh, in the second um, in the second uh, volume of um, uh, Black Quantum Futurism's uh, anthology um, series, the piece that I wrote in there actually um, is about my um, the superheroes that I created when I was in the fifth grade um, are experiencing this sort of like crisis on infinite earths, like end of the universe type thing. And they're um, trying to like find a device that will enable them to escape into the real world. And they're like, they're trying to either meet or save me in the real world. And so I, the story goes back and forth from, you know, their struggle in their fictional world to like what was happening in my life mm -hmm. um, when I was in fifth and sixth grade. And so it, it's sort of like this meta telling of, um, you know, the power of, of these inventions, the power of these kind of like um, uh, universality, universes that we create that are just more than just escapism, but they're actually like, they can be our religion, they can be our like spirituality, they can be our anchor, they can be our tool for survival, and they can be our weapon to employ against our oppressors. And so that was kind of like what that story was about. And it's like a meta retelling of like me meeting my inventions mm. on a higher plane. Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's like scary and <laughs> interesting. It was weird. It was definitely scary to write. It was pulling some stuff out that I was like, okay, this is gonna be good. But if y'all can ever find it, I think it's still in print. Just go to Black Quantum Futurism's, Futurism's website. Okay, cool. Um, you can order it. The second volume, that's, that's the one I'm in. Okay. Um, and I did want to go back to something, Alex, that you said um, in the first question about that I was thinking about. Um, and this is, this is a question for both of you about like this, like of the immediacy of the internet. And I know both of you work in um, work with uh, digital works and, and things like that. And I was wondering like how that immediacy um, over time, has that had any um, effect on on your work? How you think about um, putting out your work, or how you think about you know coming up with different projects? Has that has that change in 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 velocity of the of this like internet age? Has that changed how you um, approach your work? Yeah. Um, other than being a distraction, not really. Um, and other than, and also meeting people, that's been a really good tool for me to meet people and get some, get some gigs, you know, right for Bandcamp and stuff like that. But um, like, I don't actually use the computer, like I don't have a, I don't use um, uh, digital work spaces or whatever to um, make music. I'm usually in bands or something. And I also do hand cut collage. So wow. I don't, I don't really like use the computer. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so distracting. <laughs> and it's like scary and vast. And it's like, wow, you know, 14 different um, tabs up or whatever. And you just like, you don't want to log out of any of them. But it's, yeah, mostly it's just been distracting and um, frustrating too, because I see a lot more media that's like, kind of whack or something and I'm just like you know I, I'm just like kind of upset that there's a lot of like whack stuff out there but yeah that's a whole nother topic I guess <laughs> uh, Andrea uh, well for me it's really been um, it's really offered me a way to expand my um, you know I, I have fond memories of the cut and paste collage um, but that constant quest for the material culture to, you know, um, and the way the culture changed, the nature of what I find in magazines is much less satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more um, uh, disconnected uh, from like historical um, identities. And, and I guess I really do prefer um, like archival materials, which I find very uh, easy to um, connect with online. Mm. So it's kind of a double-edged sword because in that way that Alex and I have been talking about, uh, he mentioned also, um, I'm sorry, uh, pronouns he, they? Yes, he. he. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like managing boredom, boredom 
at a time before the internet, you really needed that creative spark where you could see your clothespins, <laughs> you know, and turn them into, uh, you know, any kind of intergalactical species. Um, and, and, and as I was speaking about the ways I developed this love of eavesdropping to kind of learn things from people who aren't speaking to me, <laughs> um, but are speaking around me. In the internet age, I guess you can fill in all your gaps of understanding through Google searches, though that feels a little scary, <laughs> you know, if you don't know what a good source is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what does that mean for the ways people are creating? Because you don't have to solve a lot of those problems on your own anymore. Mm -hmm. And you don't really have to suffer the boredom if you have a phone that can connect you immediately with, you know, a movie or, or worlds that somebody has already created. Um, so I, I have a complicated relationship with the, the uh, digital age. <laughs> yes. That said though, I just, I spend so many hours in the archives and, and looking for um, old clips of films of, you know, just finding Pearl Primus dancing, you know, there's hardly any footage of this amazing life, you know. Um, and so searching for these things leads me to create things that I didn't even know, because I don't have to be intentional, like that, the happy accidents that happen. Mm -hmm. um, when you find yourself in an archive and you come across a piece of footage that you didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. And then that informs a whole new story um, to tell. Um, and then at three o'clock in the morning, you know, when I was coming up, if you needed that kind of information or that kind of imagery, you had, you know what I mean? You had to wait till the next day, get on the bus, go to the library, you mm -hmm. know, get a, you know, Xerox copy. Um, and so now at three o'clock in the morning, if I am in, in a bout of insomnia, I can get online and find, you know, lots of available images. So it really, I think it has um, been kind of a boon to my creative practice. Yeah. Also, also like, um, for me personally, like, I, uh, I love what you were saying about, like, the types of images and, um, the uh, sort of characters that people in my universe have um, been drastically shifting towards um, essentially like marginalized uh, people, right? And like, we're just, we're marginalized. So we're not, we're not in vogue, right? <laughs> we're not in like like uh, Life or Allure magazine or whatever, right? And um, I have a fondness for um, centering larger black bodies in my work. Um, and so I've, I've been using Google a lot and, um, you know, trying to find images of, um, like, I guess the bear culture in the queer community or whatever. Um, you know, it's been difficult too, because it's a very white centered, um, community, but, um, so I've used Google to try to like find images. <laughs> the funny thing is I, I found an image for like one of my earlier collages and like the person contacted me like two days after I posted it. they were like hi and I'm like oh hi <laughs> so, so it's like you know the the scarcity of like larger black male bodies that I find like you know interesting and want to um empower through my art um led me to like actually coming like face to face or like keyboard to keyboard with one of my subjects. So that's a, that's a funny anecdote about how the internet has been both helpful and a little bit on the sort of like side. So it's kind of like, you know, good and bad situation or whatever. And uh, yeah, so, and I still haven't um, found a new subject for that piece, but I, I might show it here. Okay. But um, yeah, I had to like do a cis and disease type situation, but it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> A brother, ain't, a brother ain't got money to pay for models, so not right now, anyway. So, but. yeah, I was. It was funny. I was um, when Andrew was talking about uh, going in the library to copy. I was like, oh, I remember those days of like trying to come up with fifteen cent for the, for the copy machine and like 
try to buy, like fold the book at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but but speaking of that, I did want to um, kind of like segue this question into. I know I asked um, both of you like show a piece of visual art and sort of um, kind of like take us through your process and um, how you came up with it and you know um, just like history of the piece and stuff. So does anybody either of you want to start or should I go on? I'll leave it up to Andrew. I'll, do, I'll go first a second. Doesn't matter. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just go and then I can okay. sit back and uh, relax. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, all right, so let me see about. Are you able to share? Okay, it says I cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Hmm. Wait, let me see. Hold on. Um... That was my bad. I'm sorry. You should. Oh, okay. Cool. Speaking of having um, multiple tabs open at once. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that looks like mine. <laughs> but now, let's see. Can I move this so I can? Um, so this is a piece um, that's kind of a digital collage. Um, mm. Oh, wow. So this is just a, um, you know, it's it's one of these odd things because it's it's filmic and yet nothing happens. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a collage, but it's a video collage, mm -hmm. um, and so what I'm trying to do. is kind of ask, can you all hear the music? Can you hear the sound? No, I okay. can't. Okay, I think I might have to, I'll have to take out the, oops, now you can see my, embarrassing. Oh, you hear now. <laughs> So again, I, I think um, I'm asking my viewer to kind of do some work in these images. And I, I don't necessarily know um, that it is an intuitive experience because it's not, uh, I feel like it is kind of an invention that I've created these digital collages. and. Um, So like what is being signified in this piece, and this is called the Museum of Black Joy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's inspired by quite a few different um, inspirations. Um, I'm always trying to bring uh, a, as many cultural aspects into the story. So the music in the background is uh, Sweet By and By um, by Elizabeth Cotton who is, um, you know, just a kind of a folk hero of mine, um, an elder Black woman, um, guitarist, uh, songwriter, um, who just for no other reason than she, her life intersected with the guitar and she had a, a gift and it's become self-taught. Um, the, some of the things that are being signified here um, in this Museum of Black Joy, which is a humble home of, of a Black family. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see uh, the indigo 
the rice, the tobacco, the cotton. So these are the cash crops that the, you know, that this country is built on, the wealth of this country. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also signifying, uh, you know, the Ankh, the uh, cowrie shells, mm -hmm. um, Duafe symbols in the earrings, I'm making those connections to West African heritage. Um, the underlying moving images, like, you know, the water is always signifying that middle passage. Um, birds signifying, you know, that idea of freedom. Um, the African walking sticks, um, you know, just signifying the strength, the endurance, the movement from one uh, place in history to the next. Mm -hmm. um, the zebra uh, is just, I don't know if you all are familiar with this um, idea. You know, you see a zebra with these stripes, you might think that makes the zebra an easy target. Um, but when the zebras are all together in a herd, they take on uh, the appearance of kind of like the heat wave in Africa. So with mm -hmm. those stripes, it makes it impossible to, to distinguish one from another. Mm. Um, and so that is actually their protection. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, um, I don't know if you were able to catch the, um, the salt that's passing through the body of the mother figure, you know, the salt of the earth coming through um, the ankh, the symbol of life. Um, the constant fire. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm signifying a lot and most of it is not going to be obvious. So to a certain extent, some of it is just for me. Um, mm. This piece is also inspired uh, by uh, Antozaki Shange's novel, uh, Sass Sassafras, Cypress, and Indigo. So these are the three daughters. Um, that's uh, sac sassafras behind the stall's head, mm -hmm. cypress, um, and the indigo again. Um, and this is, you know, for those of you who have read it, it's a, a story about the power of Black women in particular, um, women who know their magic, um, women who are transforming the world through their creativity and their essential qualities. Um, and uh, I will show you another piece that this is kind of um, inspired by mm -hmm. Horace Pippin's The Dominoes Players. Mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, the kind of image that I've always been attracted to, uh, so-called, you know, naive painter. In other words, like not skilled in the European, you know, styles, but it's a humble image that to me just resonates so much love and so much of what it means to grow up, um, you know, in a segregated community where outside eyes look at it and find it shabby, but inside our eyes know that this is a story of love mm. um, and care. And absent all of the, you know, wealth and things, like we have this abiding love and, and this uh, capacity to uphold traditions and to use, you know, the least to create the most, right? Um, and so I've always been um, deeply connected to that type of uh, humble imagery. Um, and again, this is just something that I learned how to do uh, just out of a sense of invention because I don't have Photoshop or any of those things. I create these in Keynote. Um, and you know, they make me happy. And, and I, you know, I get like a lot of, well, what, what is it supposed to be? What, what's nothing happens. And I'm like, I disagree. I feel like there's a lot happening. Um, and it's not that different from, uh, you know, just a regular collage, um, but I've just animated it 
to give it just a secondary depth um, and to include as much of um, like the, the um, like I said, cultural signifiers of some of our forgotten artists like Elizabeth Cotton. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> I could like have like a whole Q&A on that, <laughs> but I'll keep my, and I'll, um, I'll um, uh, give it over to Alex so he can, he can, he can start to share. Is that visible? Is that visible? Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is like a little folder I have of stuff. Um, okay. <clears throat> so this is my latest piece. And um, as I mentioned, um, my favorite rapper, MF Doom, died. And um, honestly, I'm just, I'm, I'm not over it right now. I mean, I thought that this piece was going to, um, <sighs> was going to, um, like be a salve on that, but it's just been like really hard. Um, I can barely listen to his music without just being like his music is already transportive and was so essential to me as a as a human being. Um, so I just start and it's and it's already has this weird sort of uh, strangely nostalgic otherworldly feel to it. So it's been very hard for me to like. Uh, come to grips with that and then to sort of contemplate the loss of my mom as well. Um, but uh, I used some um, uh, Marvel Comics imagery, a little bit of, of an obscure image. These are um, what they call Shi'ar um, deities from a um, group of people called the Shi'ar. Uh, I didn't want to use like Thor or Iron Man or anybody that like everyone knows because of the MCU. Um, so I use these two, um, they're sort of like, uh, guiding, uh, doom, you know, mm -hmm. um, he's a person that had a lot of demons and, um, probably could have used their guidance in a way. Um, they're not the most, um, benevolent gods. They're very, uh, selfish, but they're also like, you know, the idea of this like ethereal, um, uh, point of reference for like the guiding of doom spirit is like very, very important to me. Um, all of this is like hand cut um, from a uh, issue of Wire magazine. I use a little splash of color there. Most, mm -hmm. a lot of my, a lot of my collage art is black and white, um, but I work the uh, Kinko's copier to um, do different things like uh, uh, increasing images, shrinking images, negative reversing images, mirroring images, um, doing, working the, the shade button to get different depth. Uh, I'm, uh, in my drawing, I'm not good at texture and depth and perspective, but I feel like I don't do a pretty good job of it in my collage. It's, it's really hard. Um, so, um, and yeah, just uh, so I use New York City um, as the sort of like, um, crystallizing of uh, just like doom, you know? Um, let's see. Uh, this is the cover of my band's album. Um, my band is called Solarized and we're sort of this noisy punk rock band. Um, I, I guess I wanted, so hard, punk and hardcore are two mediums that don't have a lot of, uh, Black representation. And um, I wanted to create, again, this harkens back to the just the idea that like these universes have lived in my mind for since the, since <laughs> I was a child. So um, I wanted to create with my friends an album that would um, be something that I would just love as an 18 year old just getting into punk and alternative music. And I think we did that sonically. And then I wanted the, the album cover to be something that would, uh, you know, that I would also cherish because uh, good album art is 
um, it, it's a lost art. It's a lost practice um, in the digital age. That's another thing that has suffered in the digital age is like music, the art of sequencing an album, the art of uh, the art of the art of the album, the layout, just the tangibility of music. Like we're closer than ever before to the people that make the music, or we feel like we are. We feel everyone feels like they're one DM away from like becoming best friends with Ariana Grande or like Jay Z or somebody. But like um, the real tangibility of music is being able to either experience it live or like hold this twelve inch vinyl in your hands. So I wanted to create something that was just kind of massive and felt um, dense, but still had like my the signifiers of my art. And um, I'm really into the idea of like creating the, creating a universe, creating a space, like going beyond branding and just creating something that feels like uh, people can like latch onto or collectively recognize and understand and feel empowered by. Sort of like what, what the, uh, you know, the public enemy, um, uh, crosshair symbol represented for me, or like the Wu Tang W, or the hieroglyphics smiley face. You know, I mean, those kinds of things um, really impacted me as a kid, like the black flag bars, you know. And so I like to, um, throughout all the mediums that I work with, writing, art, music, I like to create a sort of like um, this idea that you like can feel like you're a part of a movement and like things are self-referential in enough ways that are, that feel familiar and feel empowering, but they're also like forward thinking, like are constantly like pushing you to sort of understand things in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if I have a more. Um, like hide the children or whatever, but this one is a little bit more like I guess risque. I, I really wanted to. I've really been getting into sumo wrestling, basically, and um, I re I really like highlighting uh, uh, larger male bodies of color because it's just not um, seen in art, and um, I just really like the power of this uh, pose and uh, just the idea of um, yeah. It's just it's just mostly about um, like power and what is power. Um, who can be the heroes in their own stories? Who could be, what kinds of bodies can be super? What kinds of bodies can be heroic? And um, yeah, that's kind of what that's about. Awesome. And I have a whole, I kind of have a whole series. Um, this, I call it the Sumo series. And I guess I'll show this last one. Um, this piece was a flyer. So a lot of my, so I started doing art because I was doing flyers for shows, right? And everyone's like, oh, you should make prints of that. And I'm just kind of like, like you know, like sort of backhanding my own or backburnering my own artistic whatever because esteem and um, capitalism and white supremacy tells you that you should devalue yourself, right? So I'm just, so I put it off for like decades. And then like I started like just really enjoying the process of creating flyer because I knew that like the flyer is kind of like, the album art for an event, right? Like it's like the, the, the image that you have in your mind of the event and what's about to go down is sort of like, in, can be encapsulated by the flyer. And this was um, a panel that um, uh, featured some of my friends um, from both Philly and Richmond. Um, they were talking about uh, African, uh, the connection between uh, queerness and African spirituality and the future and of course, <laughs> ding, 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 that checks all of my boxes. So I just wanted to create something that felt um, a little bit dramatic and felt a little bit um, like attainable at the same time, you know? Um, and yes, I, I used an image of a, a black woman in a heroic pose, but not in a pose that's so like, um, that's something that you can just like grasp onto is like, she's a powerful black woman. like. Um, but she's also vulnerable and worthy of being protected and she can smile and she can go be goofy. Like just because she's like a space goddess or whatever, doesn't mean that she can't have days where she just wants to listen to Lizzo and like drink lattes and stuff. And you just have to deal with the fact that she's not saving the universe right now. So yeah, I just wanted to create that sort of, like whenever I use um, marginalized bodies, it's always within that context. Like, Yes, these people can be heroic too, 
but they can also just chill if they want to. Like, um, you you have to earn their um, you have to earn their power. You have to earn their their beauty. And um, like, you know, we're so we're so disposable to the larger, you know, to the larger community. But for me, like, I feel like we're we should be the heroes of our own story. So um, yeah, so that's my art. Um, I guess I can, can talk. <laughs> I guess I'll stop sharing there. Um, yeah. So awesome. yeah, so um as I said before, like I'm I'm blown away by both of your work. And one thing I did want to know, just at looking at um all of the all of the references that um come in for your work, I wanted to know um who are um some of your biggest artistic influences or whose lineage artistically do you find yourself in and how and how does that come into your work like are you um you know reading something and absorbing or are, do you feel like there are people in your dna that are working through you so yeah that's that's the question um i i steal everything like <laughs> um, <laughs> like I, i'm just a thief i, I sample um like, uh, it's just it's just the idea. So I just I just like I'm just like as I was saying like I just I just go I'm gonna do this, but I'm gonna do this better. Um, mm. And something totally original and totally weird and totally distorted and totally not the thing I thought I was gonna do comes out. It's kind of like being like, oh, I'm gonna write it like you know a musicians like oh I'm gonna write this song and I know it's gonna sound like fucking uh, or excuse me it's gonna sound like. Um, Marvin Gaye and it like comes out like totally sound like MC Hammer or something like they totally just missed like that mark or whatever they're trying to do and and I feel like I do that um a lot so I I I'm always thinking about like yeah MF Doom uh, Samuel Delaney and <laughs> Ramir Bearden and Faith Ringgold and like Rodney McMillan and you know like William Pope L um I desperately try not to copy like Wingechi Mutu like um so sometimes when i do a collage i look at other collages but a lot of times i'm like i need to like not look at this people who make collage work so i can like not do the thing that they did with the thing you know so and try to like look at other mediums that are that have a similar vibe and feel but don't necessarily like cross over to my exact genre that i'm trying to make you know what i mean so yeah like my influences are like all over the map and uh mostly and you know like sun Ra, like avant-garde jazz was a huge, hugely influential on me because I was coming out of punk rock and being a little bit burnt out on that medium because it's like essentially this kind of like white boys club, right? And then um, right when I was getting burnt out on punk, I started working at a record store and they were re-releasing all of these jazz records um, on labels like Actuel and all these jazz records were coming into the store and I was like, wait a minute, who are all these black weirdos on the cover of these, of these records? And so I, it was a whole new world was open to me, like mm-hmm. finding out about like Max Roach and, um, you know, Sonny Chirac and Sun Ra, like uh, Pharaoh Sanders, Ornette Coleman, like all at once, you know, Alice Coltrane, you're just like, oh, this is a lot. And so those, those people really influenced me. deeply. So yeah, just... But yeah, those are those are all my Grant Morrison, you know, I could just go on and on naming people and pointing to the exact like thing that I did that was inspired by them. So, yeah. Absolutely. What about you, Andrea? So for me, you know, all roads lead to, um, you know, the Harlem Renaissance and um, and the black arts movement in particular. Um, the Harlem Renaissance was a little bit softer, I think. Um, and then the black arts movement, they're a, a lot more confrontational, um, you know, and that may not actually be true because being soft at that time, you know, at the turn of the century, early in the 20th century was probably confrontational enough, mm. you know. Um, but, uh, you know, there are a couple seminal texts um, Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God for that way, just like I, I spoke about Horace Pippin, 
um, where there was no um, hanging back from the cultural context, like without explanation, you know, this is um, a story using a dialect, um, excluding, you know, white people altogether, you know, even before Toni Morrison, um, you know, takes her, her stance. Um, Jean Toomer's book, Kane, is, um, you know, to me, he's like, look, I got poems, I got short stories, um, they're connected and yet they're not. It was kind of like the first kind of collage book that I'm aware of um, that, you know, and it just, you know, starts with, you know, Corintha, you know, um, the story of Corintha who's, uh, and now all of a sudden I can't uh, call the line. Um, but it, he's like holding um, the men in that community accountable to this young girl um, ripening a thing before it's time, you know, um, kind of calling that 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 um, experience for black girls out. Mm -hmm. um, and then Gwen Brooks for me is kind of like my touch tone. Um, because she makes me ask myself, how can I do it better? Mm -hmm. How can I um, do more with the language? Um, how can I refuse to settle into the cliche or the first lines that occur to me? Um, even if those first lines are those ones that kind of come through you, right, as a poet and it's pure poetry and it doesn't really need more work, I still have to ask myself, does it need more work? Um, can I say this? in the most Andrea way, you know, the most poetic and most coming from who I am um, as a rare and individual person. Um, so those are kind of, um, and you know, and not just the writing of the poets from the Black Arts Movement, the way that they were in proximity to me in my community. Like, it wasn't like, you didn't have to go on any college campus to hear the poets. They showed up at the laundromat, at the park. They would let you buy them a cup of tea or, you know, with the Miri, you know, a bourbon and a steak. <laughs> and, and they would, you know what I mean? And they would talk to you. You know, it wasn't like a hierarchy. It was, you know, we're in this thing together. You want to talk poetry? Let's talk poetry. You know, what are you doing? Who are you reading? You know, um, why are you professing this with so much uh, pride and certitude when you haven't read, <laughs> you know what I mean? When you haven't read your elders, like they will hold you to task, but in a way that was loving. Um, and uh, so that kind of and I think that informs the kind of way that I create my websites because I don't necessarily have the personality to be out there in the way that some of those poets were in my world. So I'm trying to create my websites in a way that they act as that portal of discovery. So, you know, if you look at this uh, collage, you can connect to the story of, um, of Elizabeth Cotton. So I'm trying to build them so as I'm signifying, I can also inform your understanding by letting you click through to the different um, depths of understanding that the work is built on. Oh, awesome. Okay, so I wanted to add, I wanted to ask both of you to um, read something. Um, and then after that, um, I, we're going to go into uh, Q&A. Um, cause I think, again, one of the things that, um, really, um, strike me about both of you is just the number of genres that you work in, um, which I, which I love. So I would love to get the people to hear, um, your, your, uh, more literary work. So, um, so I guess we can, um, start with Alex and then go to Andrea and then we can go from there. Um... 
Ironically enough, um, I was just talking about how we don't need Insta responses to things, but last night I couldn't sleep. So I did write a piece. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to read that really fast. And then I'm going to read another piece from um, my book, Arc Dust, but it's going to be a super short piece. Like it's the beginning of a piece. Um, so this is, this is what I wrote last night. Denmark Vesey was a start. Frederick Douglass was a start. Harriet Tubman was a start. The Harlem Renaissance was a start. The Black Star Line was a start. The self-determined Black towns in Rosewood, Slocum, Tulsa, Springfield, and what is now known as Brooklyn was a start. The armed anti-Klan insurrections and protectors in the South was a start. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was a start. The Alabama bus, cots was, bus boycotts was a start. The Stonewall riots was a start. I Have a Dream was a start. The Black Panther Party, Move, those were starts. Watts Uprising was a start. LA Uprisings was a start. Attica Uprisings was a start. Mm. Keeping Asada Shakur free, that was a start. Mm. Freeing Angela Davis was a start. The Black Liberation Army was a start. Ending apartheid was a start. We started with hip hop. We started with the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Act Up and Queer Nation was a start. The first Black this and the first Black that, that was a start. Octavia Butler was a start. Audre Lorde was a start. My existence was a start. Derek Chauvin's conviction is not a start. Mm. Abolition is a start. So mm. last night. Mm. Um, and just out of, you know, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but just out of like the frustration of like these easy victories, like, you know, oh, Biden's in office, we can chill. Like <laughs> oh, Eric Chauvin got off. Oh, like good things are gonna start happening, you know, like, and, and like, yeah, so. And this is from Art Dust. From the final flight of the unicorn girl. We grinned at sin mostly, spiraling through black ether as bright yellow wave crash landing on the roof or splashing into windows on wires, reeling off one-liners and brash talk that belied the danger in the situation. A flunky with bad breath and an ill-fitting suit would pull some kind of lever. And these hired goons, probably deadbeat fathers with no pension or former mercenaries bored and ill-adapted to civilian life or meatheads spawned from some cult or hate group they'd just been kicked out of would all come trotting out, decorated with surplus pouches and clunky artillery hanging from the taut string of their utility belts. We waited across floors riddled with spent shell casings and turned these goons' guns into splinters. We jacked up men in suits, crashed through the skylight in the boardrooms of these shadow corporations. We hemmed mobsters, rich with the toxic nuclear steroid of the month, cement walls and guidos jacked up on superpowered drugs and contaminants. They all flinched and fired aimlessly at our swift gliding rainbow of dizzy confusion. We bounced on drug tables and kicked over artifacts illegally procured from alien worlds in alternate universes. We burned buildings down to the ground a gleeful flick of a finger on a kerosene soaked hallway swept away in the backdraft, watching the flames lick at our winged footies as we blasted back into the night sky. We stood there defiantly in the streets as we raised villain enclaves or looked through high-tech binoculars from a few miles away as one after the other, these towers of oppression fell from the lines in the sky, crumbling into a pit of ash and mold, just fragments of ideas left, just the rocks. We smiled wildly at the sight, some of us running up light posts and baying at the moon or waving flags bigger than our young bodies, bright crimson drapes of cloth swaying gently in the night breeze, emblazoned with our crests, or some of us we'd let loose in jetpacks and fireworks and let the lights entangle us in red stars and green lightning bolts and violet hearts. 
So don't just let us die out here. Mm-hmm. So that's the first story in Art Dust. Mm-hmm. Um, I self-published this and I sold out like two kind of small pressings. And then um, Bill from Rosarium was like, dude, I got to put this out. So then I haven't pressed anymore, waiting for him to finish. So hopefully this year it'll come out and it'll be my first um, publication. Art Dust is um, uh, sci-fi stories with um, queer people of color, mostly mm-hmm. black antagonists. Um, or protagonists, sometimes antagonists, but protagonists and heroes in these stories. And they're cyberpunk superheroes, sci-fi based stories. So yeah. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Andrea. Thanks, Alex. So uh, that first poem is still um, really resonating with me in this mm-hmm. moment, you know? So mm-hmm. many starts, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, it, it seems like the line keeps getting moved back right you know. and everyone approaches it with the same energy too well that's a start like you literally just said that like three months ago after biden was elected you literally just said that three months ago when blah 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 i'm just like yeah the energy's wild right now so mm-hmm. um so i'm gonna uh read uh i guess uh maybe a couple poems from my collection, The Black Body Curve. Um, and The Black Body Curve is kind of a, a deep personal meditation on the uh, May 13, 1985 bombing of 6221 Osage Avenue. I grew up at 62nd and Spruce Street, so that's my neighborhood. And um, so I'm going to read a, a couple poems from the section um, of the book that is really, um, it's called The Dead Street Scrolls. Mm-hmm. And it's just so much of the conversation around the MOVE bombing is around the politics uh, of the MOVE family, um, the, um, the insanity of the institutional um, response. And so this is a section of my book that's just about the fact that, yo, this, this is where we used to play. Mm. Um, this was, we were there kind of um, just enjoying being in community with each other. And um, so th- it's just kind of, this poem is called Yesterday. And um, again, they're just little sketches of the life um, that we were living yesterday. To get there, walk. Down 62nd to Osage. Follow the hedge where green switches grow into weapons. They used to beat your ass with them switches. (laughs) Follow the hedge where green switches grow into weapons. Smack the leaves, cross your fingers, spit chortle and run. Run past old man Taylor. Don't step on the cracks. There are too many cracks. Hopscotch the painted hopscotch. Stop as it stops on the nine. Count the crooked teeth in the crooked fence. Wait for the potted ghost of geraniums. Jump three steps at a time. Let the sagging screen door sag. Don't knock. Holler your way in. Um, and you know, that's just like, you didn't, if you were trying to get to somebody's house, you didn't tell them the address. It's like, you know, it's that one third from the corner by the pot of geraniums. You know, we didn't knock. You just like, yo, what's up? You know, you holler your way into the moment. Um, this one is called Stoop Song. And it's just for anybody who grew up in Philly, just sitting on the steps doing your girlfriend's hair, just like in a row. Sweetie's hair in my hands, my hair in Peach's hands, Peach's hair in Sugar Girl's hands, Sugar Girl's hair in the hand of God. Mm. We are one, two, three, four sister girls, wild ivies climbing the concrete up from the city to Miss Betty's own front door. She keeps us on the outside. Inside that world that teaches us to slap box if it's all in fun, to make a fist and come out wailing if it's for real. Our souls sanctified, my sister's hair in my hands, 
sweet braids of victory. Mm. So, you know, just the just kind of sketches that kind of make up the you know, the easy days that you didn't think you would need to excavate because you had no idea that they would come with their bomb and no water mm. to put out your sound. Mm. Thank you very much, Andrea. And, um, and if you have not, check out um, Andrea's website. Um, it's the blackbodycurve.com. Yes, yeah. I'll put it in the chat. Okay, yes, check that out. It's, it's an amazing website. So I know we have already a couple of questions in the chat. So I'm going to um, ask those. And then if anybody else has any questions, um, you know, you could just put it in a chat and I'll um, pick those up. So the first question, let me go back up. The first question is from um, Bernadine and it says, um, Andrea, great point on intuitive invention. Did that make you more creative, shy? What was that impact? I'm gonna go with all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, because in many ways, I feel like I seemed shy because I would um, kind of sink into this interiority. And so I would get a lot of people, you know, who interpreted that kind of distance that that being in that interior life created as either shyness or in many cases, like being stuck up um, and and it wasn't until years later that I realized it was because of my capacity to focus so deeply on what is happening in my own interior life mm -hmm. that I am actually removed from that world where people are observing me. Mm -hmm. And so their reactions to me were based on that distance that I had created. Because if I felt either uncomfortable or bored in the actual space that I was inhabiting, I would go into that other place mm -hmm. that does foster like a creative um, expression. While at the same time, I'm kind of absorbing the culture and the activity that's happening in the room, but more like a computer storing it for some other creative application to maybe write a story or a poem. So it's kind of like, um, you know, like what you said, uh, Kerwin, like you had, there were kind of like two yous, like the, um, the one that kind of presented in the world, almost like a hologram or holograph, whatever they are. Right. Um, and so while I can be shy, I'd, I'm not, that's not like a fundamental aspect of my personality. I'm not really shy. I mean, I can talk to anybody. Um, I, I sometimes don't know how to read uh, when there's a lot of energy in a room. You know, sometimes I hang back because it's too much. I start short circuiting because I'm trying to take it all in and make sense of all of it. And I'm a slow processor. So like, you know, in this internet age where people are snapping back left and right with what happened, I'm like, it's gonna be about, you know, another 90 days minimum before I even know how I feel about it. <laughs> so that, you know, that sense of the kind of intuition, um, I feel like I'm moving at a slower pace than the internet world. And so I'm in a state of confusion often. So I feel like all these things make it seem like I'm shy or awkward or strange um, and or stuck up. <laughs> like I understand what people are saying now mm. um, because I'm not present in the, in the exterior world because I'm, I'm off on some tangent. Like somebody said a line you know, 
like I'm stuck with Alex's poem right now. Mm. You know what I mean? Uh, like I'm still processing that. Mm. For sure. So I'm not sure if that answered the question, but. No, oh, absolutely. Um, thank you for your question. Um, and Steve Burns has a question for Alex. Alex, in what ways do you implant parts of yourself in your universes? Do those additions happen accidentally on purpose or both? Um, hey, Steve. Um, I think like, so I was actually in one of my stories, the one I was telling you guys about, which was just like super weird. Um, I don't actually write a lot of um, first person stories because um, I feel like sometimes first person stories, like just writing like the, I did this, I did that. Um, for me, it feels like it's too easy. Like I can just bust one of those out in like a weekend or something. I don't know. It just feels like it's a weird form of writing. Like, I feel like it's just like a, lo a little easy, but um, I'm also like, more interested in like, well, I'll just answer it this way. Um, I put uh, characters in my stories that I want to see um, on a larger scale, like on screen or in a comic or in a story. And I want to read about them. And I also want to project them into the, the actual real world. Too. So like a lot of what I write is kind of like a sigil magic, like creating, like how empowered uh, spaces for people who um, are generally marginalized. And I am one of those people. So I do write about um, gay black men um, are often like the lead, you know, uh, characters in my stories. But I also, um, like when, I'm, when I put aspects of myself into the story, it's just like bits and pieces of things that I've experienced. Um, but when I find that I'm too deeply like personal with my story that it could, it could become like kind of scary. Like like the story that I was relating about writing that story about my um my old superheroes trying to find me or whatever. <laughs> that those those feel really terrifying to me. So it would take a lot of uh, emotional preparation for me to write a story where I'm specifically like the force behind it. Um, but I take aspects of myself, my friends, um, and I sort of remix my friends um as like superheroes or cyberpunks or like you know um you know yeah that kind of thing like what would happen if um andrea and curran were in the matrix and how would they get out of it and like you know th those kinds of things would spark a story actually i'm gonna write that down <laughs> but um you know those kinds of things are kind of fun like you know like what if um this zoom like transported into the matrix like how will we get out of it you know like those kinds of things and so like just pulling from real people that I know and and so it's not so much me, but it's more like aspects. <laughs> and it's intentional, it's intentional because I wanna see certain people and certain body types and certain like sexualities and genders like on the big screen, however the big screen is defined. And um, so yeah, it's intentional. <laughs> hey, awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see, I don't think there are any more questions but um i i was like because i have like a book full <laughs> i was like I, but i want to make sure that i'll also stay in the moment like so you know if something sparked me i wanted to leave space for that but yeah but no i want to thank both of you for um giving up your time to come out and discuss um your process which you know I took a lot of notes, so I'll be. <laughs> so, like, but it's, it's it's been amazing, and I and I said I have, a, and and the, this whole time I was thinking like, um, I have like a whole book of questions. We got to do a part two because <laughs> there's so, because you know, like when I when I read when I going to do like some type of discussion or interview, I'm always like looking through interviews and the work that you did and ask, asking questions based off of those. I didn't even touch those. So, <laughs> so yeah, so like we got to do a part two. So yeah, so thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, Kerwin. Yeah, no problem. So Brittany or Chris, did you guys want to say anything? Yeah, I just want to, you know, thank you all for your contributions today. This was a, an amazing conversation. Um, thank you for keeping, you know, the Robeson, we all, as, as we learned to say that the Robeson House building has been closed for the year, but the work of the Robeson House, the work of, you know, creating and seeding movements, 
um, for justice and freedom is still continuing in uh, many of your, your poetry, the artwork, the many different forms that work takes um, is definitely like continuing that to move that work forward. So thank you all. Um, and you know, uh, this is part of the free library one book series. Uh, this is being recorded. We'll be able to uh, hopefully upload it and it'll be available to watch so much to dig in. So if you, if you are a note taker, you can come back and, 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 and see things later. And then I just want to, um, you know, um, just as a reminder, uh, let folks know that, you know, this weekend that continues the campaign to free Mumia Abu Jamal. You can learn details at letmumiaout.com. Um, a lot of different activities taking place across West Philadelphia into Center City. Um, so, you know, um, as we think about the work, it's not just, you know, we think about the different arts, right? The art of protest is also something that's incredibly important. So let's continue to be there for our brothers and sisters and our kin. Um, and thank you so much for putting together a wonderful event, uh, Kerwin. Thank you, Brittany Sterner from uh, the Free Library for uh, coordinating this event. And thank you all, and we look forward to being in touch. Uh, you can follow us at paulrobersonhouse.org, um, where you'll see many more events coming up, including the start of the Radical Black Women series, uh, which launches next week, April 28th. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, maybe I should, I don't, well, we're done. Uh, Brittany, I guess you can, you can uh, when you get a chance to stop the recording. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight.